Mr. Bingler's Murder Maze, Part 2, by Wilbur S. Peacock, a suspense-ridden novelette. In Part 1 of Mr. Bingler's Murder Maze, Mr. J. C. Bingler, an amateur detective, overhears a murder plot while dining in a restaurant. He decides to investigate himself rather than going to the police due to insufficient evidence. After eavesdropping, Bingler attempts to identify the conspirators, but they escape. Back home, he discovers a wax death mask and a hat box, adding to the mystery. But he is knocked unconscious in his apartment and wakes to find the mask missing. Determined, Bingler traces the mask to a wax museum where he witnesses a suspicious transaction. Realizing the danger and complexity of the situation, he finally decides to report his findings to the police. Chapter 5 Tink Hitler It was an unhurried bustle about the police station that was like balm to Mr. Bingler's quivering nerves. He scuttled through the doorway, passed unnoticed into the waiting room, knocked timidly on the door marked Captain Donovan. The knock went unnoticed, and he mopped his forehead with a large handkerchief, tried desperately to control his shaking knees. But there was a light in Mr. Bingler's eyes, for he believed that he was on the track of some master criminal, and such was his makeup that he was like an eager pup chasing a bus, anxious to catch it, but not knowing what he would do with it if he should. Mr. Bingler gulped, pushed open the door, went in without further knocking. He sidled to one side, watched the captain of detectives with worshipping eyes, amazed at his temerity at invading the office. Well, what is it now? Captain Donovan snapped without looking up. Hmm, er, Captain, Mr. Bingler said nervously. Oh, so it's you, Mr. Bingler, the detective said disapprovingly. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't talk to you right now. I'm terribly busy. But, Captain, Mr. Bingler said hurriedly and mysteriously, I think I've uncovered a crime. Captain Donovan seemed to shrink within his uniform, and his eyes lifted in a silent plea. He started to speak, was interrupted by the buzz of the enunciator. He listened a moment, then his voice raised in a bull-like roar. Now get this, he bellowed. You shake down every house on Fraternity Row. You tell those half-baked brats that if that body isn't returned to the laboratory within an hour, I'll personally see to it that all fraternities are barred from the campus. He snapped the switch, glared unseeingly into space. Those damned college kids drive me nuts, he said finally. Them and their initiations. Now they're stealing stiffs from the medical laboratory at the school. Yes, sir. Mr. Bingler agreed bewilderingly. He stood there, a quaking little man, realizing suddenly how foolish and quixotic had been his impulse to bring this pitiful mystery to the harassed officer's attention. He shifted nervously from one foot to the other, his white hair a tousel, the derby and sword umbrella, in one veined hand, his mind trying to fashion a valid excuse for his being there. Captain Donovan's eyes softened a bit as he watched the meek little man before him. I checked up on Trotter, he said. He and a man he called Simpson murdered a gem salesman. The police caught him, but Simpson got away with eighty thousand dollars worth of unset stones. Does that help any? Yes, thank you, Mr. Bingler said. The enunciator buzzed briefly. Yes, the detective said sharply, his face hardening. All right, we'll go right up. Get Sweeney and Carpenter and call headquarters. He switched off the annunciator, strode around the edge of his desk. There's been a murder uptown, some guy named Miller, so your mystery will have to wait. If you want to hang around, I'll talk to you when I get back. Without waiting for an answer, he was gone through the door. His voice sounded for a moment in the outer room. There was a shuffle of feet on the floor. Then a siren wailed from the street, the tones diminishing in the distance. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler unhappily. He stood indecisively for a moment, debating the best course to follow. He frowned a bit, realizing that he alone could not hope to cope with a master villain, knowing that he should go home and forget his romantic notions about being a crime crusader before he got his small headshot from his narrow shoulders. But there was a bit of character in Mr. Bingler, as unbending as chrome steel. He blinked with sudden resolve, went toward the files at the rear of the office. 
He found the city directory, carried it to the desk, flipped through the pages. Mr. Bingler beamed benevolently on the book, nodded relievedly. The decision had been forced upon him because Captain Donovan had not paused long enough to hear of the murder that was to happen, or a ghastly thought set Mr. Bingler's head to swimming, had already happened. Yes, Mr. Bingler had to pinch it for the police in this emergency. He concentrated for a few minutes on the fine print, frowned slightly when he found that Harvey Wilson and James Reeves were partners, jointly owning and running an importing concern. That information made the coming crime even worse. A partner was about to kill the man he was in business with, with the obvious motive of inheriting the entire company under a partnership contract. Mr. Bingler girded up mental loins, went unhesitatingly toward an imaginary lion's den. Chapter 6 Housebreaker Mr. Bingler hesitated on the street, the blood of some Scottish ancestor rebelling against wasting more money on a taxi ride. He clambered aboard a passing bus, seated himself on a rear seat of the upper deck. He knew now what he had to do. He must go to Harvey Wilson and warn him that his partner was preparing to murder him before the night was gone. He relaxed comfortably, smiling like some aged cherub, completely satisfied with the simple solution of the problem. With Wilson knowing what was to happen, he could trap his partner and turn the quivering wretch over to the police. He wished, momentarily, that he had been invited to accompany the police in their investigation of a murder. With the aid of his home detective course's training, the crime would have been solved in short order. Mr. Bingler swore petulantly, remembering how his home detective course had failed him this night. He also felt a sick feeling of futility because he had not solved some horrible crime. True, he had discovered a crime was to be committed had fallen heir to a death mask that was tied in, somehow, with a master villain, and had been slugged by some friend retrieving the mask. But somehow Mr. Bingler felt that he had missed the one thing that would have made the evening perfect. He thought of that for a while, remembering the two cases he had solved in the past, thinking of the time when he would be able to put the E.I. of an expert investigator after his name. And maybe his breath caught in his throat with sudden longing. Some day he might be able to contribute something to crime detection and be permitted to rank himself as an N.D., Master Detective. Mr. Bingler sighed deeply, realizing how foolish were his wishes, for he knew only too well that he was but an insignificant mortal on a world that was harsh and unfriendly to any but masterful men. And then the bus was at the corner of 80th Street, and he was scrambling down the steps to the sidewalk. He trudged slowly down the walk, strolling with what he hoped appeared to be casual nonchalance, the raincoat swishing about his skinny legs, the sword umbrella jauntily in one hand. His heart leaped a bit in excitement when he came to 7964. He saw the dark car beside the house in the curving drive and spied the reflections of two men on the drawn curtain of a second-floor window. Mr. Bingler paused in mid-stride, wondering if he were too late to prevent the murder. Two men were in the house, and one of them could be James Reeves, the calculating master villain. For one interminably long moment there was only a helpless distress in his troubled mind. Then he continued his walking, fearful of the results that might come if he gave his story to Harvey Wilson, while Reeves was listening. He stopped just past the high hedge, trying to recall bits of his home detective course that might give a solution to the situation confronting him. Mr. Bingler shrugged, muttered maledictions against the course that had failed him so utterly that night, and ducked into the shadow of the hedge. He scuttled like a frightened rabbit toward the rear of the yard until he was certain he could not be seen from the window, then wormed through the hedge on hands and knees. A dozen scurrying steps brought him against the wall of the house. He gulped in nervous excitement, filled his mouth with a dozen peppermints to stop the chattering of his teeth, then worked his way cautiously along the wall. He turned the corner, padded silently for twenty feet, then halted with a hiss of indrawn breath when his outstretched hand encountered a screen door propped open with a brick. Mr. Bingler froze into motionlessness, his myopic eyes searching the night for a hidden watcher. He remembered all of the stories he had read in which the intrepid hero had stepped into such an innocent-looking trap. 
Then he chuckled ruefully, felt extremely foolish, when he recalled the obvious fact that he was not expected. Too, in all probability, the door was securely locked. But the door swung gently open at his touch on the knob. Mr. Bingler slipped through, stood quaking in the darkness, a spider of apprehension crawling with hairy legs up his spine. He knew that any moment he might get a slug through his small body for housebreaking. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler, swallowed five peppermints. Then his courage stretched a bit, and he went slowly forward. He might as well, he told himself, waste a few more minutes now that he was on the premises. He smiled smugly at his hopeful reasoning, groped his way down the dim hall toward a thread of light edging from beneath a closed door. He listened at the panels for seconds, heard nothing, pushed the door open and slipped through. A nightlight glowed dimly over a kitchen table. Another door stood invitingly open across the room, and he slipped through it with incredible stealth. A gleaming stairway rose from the far end of the hall in which he found himself, and he drifted toward it. Dull light came from an open doorway at his right, and a quick surreptitious peering around the door jamb convinced him that the room was empty. He darted through, his gaze sweeping what was obviously a library. Papers littered a massive desk in one corner, and a large divan was pulled close to the fireplace. Aboriginal weapons hung in wicked splendor over the mantel, and several hunting prints made bright splotches of color on the paneled walls. Mr. Bingler paused irresolutely, hearing the hum of voices from overhead, fearful that he might be discovered at any moment. Then his curiosity gained control of his good sense, and he moved toward the desk. He nodded gently when he read the letterheads on the notepaper. Gathering up several sheets of paper in a clumsy, sweating hand, he held them up to the light for a better look. He gasped, his skinny Adam's apple bouncing against his celluloid collar, his myopic eyes bulging at the import of the words on the paper. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler for he had uncovered the final bit of evidence that he had needed to convince Harvey Wilson that he was to be murdered that night, the final evidence that proved James Reeves was a calculating killer without the slightest of scruples. He heard the footsteps then, and the papers rustled from his terrified hand to the desk. For one interminable second he was too paralyzed with fright to move. Then he whirled, ducked around the divan, fell prone between the divan and the fireplace. He cringed against the floor, saw the single pair of feet move to the desk. He felt an insane desire to sneeze, raised his head and laid a skinny finger along his upper lip. He saw the dead face on the couch, smiled a bit. At least his deductions about the death mask were right. It did have something to do with the murderer's scheme. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler aloud. He gagged, unconscious of the startled gasp of the man at the desk his watery eyes fearfully scanning the white face and rigid body of the corpse on the divan. He had been too late to help Harvey Wilson. He knew that now, for the man stretched so stiffly on the cushions was beyond mortal aid. Mr. Bingler heard the footsteps at his back, whirled in frightened reflex. He cringed, seeing the contorted face of the man at his side, the same man he had seen paying money to another in the wax museum. Alp, gulped Mr. Bingler, tried to dodge the murderous fist that loomed with increasing speed in his frightened face. His right hand automatically sought for and found the handle of his sword umbrella. He ducked to one side, and the fist followed with an uncanny prescience. Dimly, he heard his teeth click together, and then the top of his head seemed to lift higher and higher until contact with the beamed ceiling blotted out all consciousness. Mr. Bingler went down slowly, folding tiredly over the divan arm, then slipping quietly to the floor, out for the second time that night. His hands relaxed, and the half-drawn sword spanged musically on the hearth. Chapter 7 Nicely Frame Mr. J. C. Bingler's head was a great bronze bell, against whose sides a large iron clapper bonged and boomed with a sickening regularity. He retched a bit at the constant noise, rolled weakly to his side, his hands pressing feebly at the cold floor. Then consciousness came back with a rush, and he winced fearfully, lest he be struck again with that terrible fist. Nothing happened, and there was no sound, so Mr. Bingler opened his eyes. Comets, 
pinwheeled in all their fiery glory before his eyes for a moment, and his skull seemed to expand and contract like a gigantic bellows. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler, and focused his bleary eyes. He blinked unseeingly for a moment, stabbing nausea, draining all strength from his body, and then his vision cleared, and he scowled in quick puzzlement. He was lying on his right side, his hand clutching the slim leg of a white painted table. By moving his head a trifle, he allowed his gaze to wander about the room, and he saw that, somehow, he was in the consultation room of a surgeon's office. Dear me, said Mr. Bingler bewilderedly, rolling to a sitting position. His eyes centered upon a door, from behind which came the steady rattle of a typewriter. Coming to his feet, his head swimming from the effect of the knockout blow, he took a short step toward the door. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler horrifiedly, and his returning strength deserted him completely, his legs crumpling until he sat again on the spotless linoleum. For it was then for the first time that Mr. Bingler saw the dead man in the white surgeon's coat, with Mr. Bingler's sword umbrella thrust through his chest, the stained point projecting a full eight inches from his back. Terror, like a supergravity, clamped the little man rigidly to the floor, stopping his breath, blanching his rabbity features. He knew then, as though he needed additional proof, that he had shoved his twitching nose into something too big for him to handle. And then that bright, indefinable something, that undefeatable thing in the character of humankind, that lifted some men above the level of their fellow men, reared itself in all its awful strength. Mr. Bingler scowled bleakly, feeling the first touch of the spur that drove him onward. He came cautiously to his feet, circled the dead man like a coonhound around its quarry, his myopic eyes searching with an intent clarity. He ranged the floor, stopping before the open window, leaned outward and peered at the shadowy ground, but a few feet below. He nodded to himself, popped three peppermints into his mouth. Then he returned to the corpse, put out a tentative hand, tugged experimentally at the gory handle of the umbrella sword. His small body winced instinctively at the strength it took to draw the sword from its human sheath. He stood there for a moment, the crimsoned weapon in his small hand, knowing that safety lay only in flight. And the office nurse opened the connecting door. Mr. Bingler watched her face automatically, scrutinizing every emotion on her features with the impersonality of a research worker. He gestured with the bloody sword to the corpse. I, er, he's dead, Mr. Bingler said inanely, stupidly. He smiled benignly, like some maniacal, murderous fiend. It took but a mere second for the nurse's scream to reach the ear-splitting crescendo of a police siren. You! she screamed in terror. Help! Murder! Police! And fainted. Mr. Bingler paused not upon the order of his going. He went from that room in a hurry, crossed the waiting room in two gigantic leaps, batted open a swinging door. He scuttled down the dim length of a corridor, still waving the crimsoned sword, giving two nurses and an intern a shock that lopped ten years from their prospective lifespan. But Mr. Bingler was not concerned with anyone but himself at the moment. Blind instinct told his flashing feet what to do when his reason failed him for the time. He bounced through an outer door, its swinging bulk knocking the sword from his nerveless hand, and was too frightened to retrieve it. He almost fell on the short flight of steps, spun right like a racing hare, went down the street with a speed that was incredible for a little man with legs as short as his. He ducked into an alleyway, his breath sobbing in his throat, a pain blossoming in his side. Oh, dear, he whimpered again and again as he pounded along the paving. He whirled around a corner, crushed into a stooping man, caromed into a wall, ended up in a gasping heap against a garbage can. Glass crashed and milk flew, and there was a dull flunk as the head of the milkman made contact with the brick wall. Mr. Bingler didn't pause for coherent thinking. He got to his feet with frightened speed, saw that the man was unmoving, and blind terror set him to moving again. He headed instinctively for the milk wagon at the curb, bounded into the interior, caught up the slack reins in frantic hands. Get! he yelled. 
lashed the horse's rump with the rein tips. The horse went into a dead run from a standing start, for probably the first time in its lethargic life. Mr. Bingler braced his feet, winced when he heard the muted crashing of milk bottles on the street below, knew that he was leaving a trail that anyone could follow. He rode the bouncing wagon like a Roman charioteer, driving the horse with an instinct that had lain dormant for years, his breathing gradually slowing and his thought processes beginning to come in a more orderly fashion. And out of the chaos of his mind came but one clear thought. He, Mr. J. C. Bingler, was as nicely framed for murder as any hero in a book, but, unlike any fictional character, he had no trick up his sleeve with which to foil the villain. The bitter galling truth shattered Mr. Bingler's stunted eel, leaving it suddenly a limp gray thing barely alive. Chapter 8 Harry Wilson The cicada burred into life at Mr. Bingler's elbow, and he relit started in sudden reflex, then crouched back in the shadow of the hedge. He shivered at the faint wail of a far-off siren, remembering his terrified flight from the hospital. He had abandoned the milk wagon after a ride of ten blocks, had boarded a passing bus, changed buses twice, and then walked almost a mile, and knew he was crouched in the shadow of the hedge that paralleled Harvey Wilson's lawn. Why he was there, he could not have explained logically. He knew only that it was from this house that he had been taken for a ride that had ended with murder. He shuddered violently, recalling the fingerprints he had left on the traitorous sword. Why, oh why, he wailed silently, wasn't I satisfied with my old life? Why couldn't I let well enough alone? The cicada burred sympathetically. Mr. Bingler tried to gain comfort from the fact that the master villain had thought him important enough to frame, but the thought only brought a cold perspiration to his scrawny body. He didn't know what to do, but he knew that he had to accomplish something in order to clear himself. He tried to fit facts together in his mind, but after a moment ran into a stone wall of thinking. Mr. Bingler stood up, took two steps around the end of the hedge. He had made up his mind that he had to face Reeves and trick him into a confession. How he, an insignificant bookkeeper, was going to bring that about, he did not know, but he had no choice in the matter. It was either catch the murderer and turn him over to the police, or burn for a crime the other had committed. A shadow came to life, and a cone of light limbed Mr. Bingler in its glow. Stand right where you are, a low voice said quietly. Mr. Bingler couldn't have moved. In fact, he wouldn't have budged for all the tea in China, he said as much. That's fine. Now, trot up into the house, the flashlight wielder commanded, and a gun muzzle edged into the funnel of light. Mr. Bingler trotted. The man with the gun opened the door by the simple expedient of touching it with his shoulder, then stood aside to permit the small quaking Mr. Bingler to pass. Through that door on the left, the gunman said, and be careful. Mr. Bingler entered the room, shrank a bit in relief when he saw that Harvey Wilson's body was gone from the divan before the fireplace. His eyes swept ever the bare desk, then flicked upward into the face of the man. He saw it clearly for the first time and he gulped in quick astonishment. Sit down, the gunman ordered, and do some explaining. Well, Mr. Bingler said, it's like this. There were solid footsteps in the hall, and John Reeves came through the door. His face went white when he saw the small man sitting on the edge of the heavy chair, and his hands clenched suddenly at his sides. Who, he said, I mean, where did he come from? He was skulking outside the man with the gun said succinctly, so I brought him in for a talk. Well, do something. Don't just stand there. Shut him up permanently. He knows the whole setup. Mr. Bingler went cold, then hot, and then chill again at the concentrated venom and hate in the deepy man's voice. His hand tightened on the tear gas pen in his raincoat pocket, and his eyes darted about for a way of escape. I, er, uh, I, he began. Start talking, the gunman said brittily. All right, Mr. Bingler came to his feet slowly, edged backward until his shoulder touched the mantle. I know the whole story. I know the two of you murdered Harvey Wilson. A gun bounced into Reeves' unsteady hand, its gaping muzzle centering on Mr. Bingler's skinny chest. 
Shut him up, he barked desperately, or I will. Wait a minute, John, the gunman said. I want to hear his story. He moved until his gun could veer easily from Reeves to Mr. Bingler. Go on with your tale, he finished. I saw Wilson's body on the divan, Mr. Bingler began. Did you, now, the gunman said, and the grating quality of his voice set Mr. Bingler's teeth on edge. Harvey, John Reeves snapped harshly, cut out the comedy. Shoot the meddling fool. He knows too much. Harvey, Mr. Bingler's heart came solidly into his Adam's apple. He choked, saw the sardonic gleam in the gunman's eyes, shrank even further from the gun muzzle at the rather terrible smile of the other. Yes, the gunman said softly. I'm Harvey Wilson. Mr. Bingler remembered the voice then, for he had heard it very distinctly in the restaurant. Oh, so many hours before. Oh, dear, said Mr. J. C. Bingler confusedly. Chapter 9 The Plan Never, in even his most fantastic dreams of crime-fighting, had Mr. Bingler visualized such a scene as this. Always he had had the whip-hand, and the villains had been cringing against the cold menace of his logical condemnations. But now he knew them for the dreams they were and realized that life is at times more astounding than fiction. Talk, Harvey Wilson said, and I mean everything you know. I figured it like this, Mr. Bingler said hurriedly. Reeves was planning to kill you for, I mean, Harvey Wilson was to be murdered. That is, go on, please, Wilson said softly. I was to die for a half million dollars of insurance. Yes, Mr. Bingler said. So you had a mask made of your face. By Miller of the Wax Museum, Wilson interrupted helpfully. Miller, Mr. Bingler said wonderingly. And with the precision of well-oiled machinery, Mr. Bingler's mind whirled a bit, fitted a few integral pieces into place, and spat out the answer to all that had happened. Mr. Bingler straightened, and he was suddenly no more a meek little man in a raincoat and derby. There was a look of incredulous shock on his hardening features, and his eyes were keen and piercing. Well, Harvey Wilson said softly, insistently. He's got the answers, Harvey, Reeves said desperately. Mr. Bingler nodded. Yes, he said evenly. I think I have. His thumb found the spring trigger of his tear gas pen. This is it, he stated. A few years ago, a man named Simpson and a partner Trotter murdered a gym salesman. Trotter was caught, but Simpson got away. Simpson had the jewels and disposed of them for enough to join a man named Reeves in an importing business. Simpson had no police record and thought he was safe from pursuit. He changed his name and became a respected citizen. He thought that his partner could never find him, because even then Simpson had not been his real name. Go on. Harvey Wilson prompted, as Mr. Bingler stopped for breath. Trotter served his sentence and was to be paroled day after tomorrow, Mr. Bingler continued, and sent a letter to Wilson that disclosed the fact that he knew who Wilson was. Harvey Wilson knew that a drastic solution to his problem must be found, or he might go to the electric chair for the salesman's murder. He didn't dare murder Trotter because the crook might have left a letter telling of the crime so he planned to kill himself. You're rather clever. Did you know that? Wilson said. Mr. Bingler nodded without pride, swallowed deeply. Well, he continued, Harvey Wilson didn't want to die in reality, so he thought he'd fake his death. He blackmailed his partner into helping him. He stole a body from the medical college, making it appear as a prank of the students, then had a wax mask made of his face by Miller. He bribed a doctor to make out a fake death certificate and a cremation order. His purpose was plain. His partner, Reeves, would hold a phony service over the corpse wearing a mask of Wilson's face, then hold an instant cremation. When Trotter showed up, there would be incontestable proof that Wilson was dead, and later on Wilson and Reeves would split the insurance. There could be no trouble in any way, for Wilson would be undeniably dead, and the insurance would be automatically paid. Sweat rode high on Reeves' forehead. Shut him up, Harvey, he said, and let's get this whole deal over with. You seem rather eager, John, Wilson said easily. Maybe we'd better hear the finish of the story. But Harvey Wilson wasn't so smart. 
Mr. Bingler said, unconscious of the interruption. He thought he was the plotter, but his partner went him one better. Pull that trigger, John, Harvey Wilson said viciously, and I'll kill you. I want to hear the rest. Mr. Bingler edged away from the mantel, his frail legs tensing. Reeves, he said slowly, figured to double-cross Wilson. He meant to go through with the fake death, then murder Wilson after the money had been paid, but I happened to get mixed up in the whole deal. I found the mask was robbed of it by Miller, who was not a brutal man at heart. In fact, he knew nothing of the real deal, but because he might have figured out the mummery, Reeves murdered him tonight. Is that right, Reeves? Harvey Wilson's eyes were suddenly dark panes of glass without expression. It was absolutely necessary, Reeves said, but the man's lying about my plans. Keep talking, Wilson said to Mr. Bingler. I came here, Mr. Bingler said, and was knocked out by Reeves. He took me to the hospital where the crooked doctor worked, called softly through the window. When the doctor looked out, Reeves thrust him through with my umbrella sword, then shoved me through the window. He thought that I'd be accused of the murder. Later, if he were questioned about the papers I read and the body I saw, he would say it was Wilson's. It was a perfect setup for everybody, including Wilson, who would be dead. Reeves would be richer by a half million dollars, and there could be no kickback. Harvey Wilson sprang to one side, his gun centering on Reeves. It makes sense, he said shortly, so much sense, in fact, that I think we'll discard the original plan, and I'll take my chances with Trotter. I'm getting out, Reeves said. Get back, Wilson's gun hand lifted a trifle. Try to stop me and there'll be trouble, Reeves cried, took a backward step, his eyes wild with indecision. Harvey Wilson emptied his gun into Reeves' blocky body. Chapter 10 Master Detective Mr. Bingler stood paralyzed with horror as the gun roared in the killer's hand. He couldn't move, and his hand was tight on the tear gas gun in his coat pocket. For a moment, the tableau held, and then Reeves was only a writhing mass of flesh on the floor, crimson staining his shirt front. The killer, his face satanic, whirled to Mr. Bingler, lifted the gun. There was hate and fear and utter savagery in his thin face as he took a slow step forward. It ends this way, he said softly. There can be no other. You were found by Reeves and shot him to death. I came in just in time to kill you. Mr. Bingler couldn't speak past the lump in his throat. He felt anything but heroic as he faced the master villain, and he knew instinctively that the sands of life were running out. He gasped jerked his clenched hand from his pocket, but in his frantic haste he released the trigger. There was a muffled shot and tear gas billowed from his pocket. He heard the click of Wilson's empty gun, went scrambling to one side, but Wilson had divined the movement and caught him before he could round the couch. The killer was incredibly strong, and his clutching fingers brought red ribbons of pain to the smaller man's body. But Mr. Bingler was imbued with the strength of terror, and he drove the heavier man back. And then Wilson caught Mr. Bingler with a looping right that threw him back a dozen feet, and then followed with a brutality that was horrible. He caught Mr. Bingler by the throat, bent him backward over a chair arm, squeezed with relentless pressure. Gas still boiled from Mr. Bingler's raincoat pocket, and its burning fumes clouded the eyes of both antagonists with pain. Mr. Bingler felt the blood congesting in his head, knew that his spine would snap at any moment. He beat futilely at the killer with his small hands, and even as a terrible grayness clouded his vision, he remembered the one weapon he had been too terrified to use. His hands fumbled together beneath the straining chest of the murderer, and then he struck again and again into the man's body. He felt the fetid breath on his face for only a brief second, then a curtain of blackness stretched over his consciousness. His arms struck feebly again and again, and then he knew no more. And even as Mr. Bingler became unconscious, Wilson loosed his grasp, stared incredulously at the little man, took a faltering step, and crumpled to the floor beside Reeves' body. Drink this, Mr. Bingler, a voice said, and liquid fire seemed to sear his throat. Mr. Bingler gasped, gagged, came instantly back to consciousness. He sat up wildly, 
his hands coming up for defense, then relaxed when he saw the concerned face of Captain Donovan hovering over his. Wilson, Mr. Bingler said weakly. He's the murderer. He killed Reeves and tried to kill me, and he— Take it easy, Mr. Bingler, the detective said gently. He's over there handcuffed. Reeves was still alive when we got here, and he told us the whole story. Mr. Bingler mopped his eyes with the wet rag the detective was holding out, swung so that the cool breeze from the window swept his face. How'd you get here? he asked. Captain Donovan shook his head. Don't ask me, he said. Things have happened so fast today and tonight, I don't know which way is up, and you seemed to be mixed up in damn near everything. You said you were on the tracks of a murder. Then there was a call from uptown. I got there and the doorman described you as the man he thought killed Miller. I came back to the office to question you, got there just in time to hear that you had killed a doctor. I went there to investigate and got a call that there was gunfire here. I come here and the place looks like a slaughterhouse. For a little man, you really get around. Mr. Bingler's grin was a sickly thing to see. Sometimes, he admitted, I think I get around too much. The detective nodded sympathetically, his eyes roaming around the room. How'd you manage to lay that Wilson out so cold? he asked. Hell, you surely don't pack that big a punch. Mr. Bingler smiled, held out his right hand so that the huge cameo ring was exposed. It's a trick ring, he explained. When the set is twisted at right angles to the mounting, it looses two hypodermic needles. And then every time I hit somebody, the needles inject a knockout drug. He sat up suddenly, his eyes wild and distended with inner excitement. He braced himself with both hands on the floor as the detective held him back with a steady hand. Easy, Bingler, Captain Donovan said. You've been through an awful lot tonight. Mr. Bingler felt the twin bite of the hypodermic needles as he sat back on his hands, but his mind was too concerned with another problem to give it any thought. He caught at the detective's arm with excited fingers. Look, he said rapidly, my home detective course says that masks have but one use in crime, and yet I found another. That means I can write a thesis, and— He fell into a delightful brown study, unconscious of the detective's puzzled gaze. And as the slow numbness crept up his thin body from his needle, punctured meager posterior, his rabbity face beamed with the rapture of a world conqueror. Mr. J. C. Bingler, M.D., Master Detective, he murmured incredulously to himself, and passed out cold. The End